Okay. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Folks, <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> Oh, every week, uh, this, this time we lift up a sister church in the area. This week is Hilton Terrace Baptist. Uh, they're over there at Hilton Terrace and Worm Springs where it changes into... Where if you go into the medical center down uh, Worm Springs Road, you go, they're in the middle of that construction mess right now. Uh, but anyway, John Burnett and his family is over there. John's a friend. I've known him literally for years. We've been on mission trips together. And uh, he's a dear brother. We want to lift up Hilton Terrace this, this morning. Also, we want to continue to lift up the, our trips. Uh, we've already mentioned it before. And uh, now, now you got a, some of you got a face you can really see with Stephen there. He is the one that's going with us. We keep talking about him. I know most of you already knew him. But uh, we are, uh, we're looking forward to going. And uh, Vicki uh, is also a part of the team. And just this morning, we got hotel, uh, our hotel is booked, so that means we got a place to stay. <laughs> so, and, that, and that's confirmed, and we're excited about that. So, you know, every one of these steps, all the pieces are back, and, and everything's uh, uh, rocking along. Now, we can just get Tracy's visa there and get the, these missionaries there, but a couple days before we get there, it'd be nice. So now you continue to pray for them, and the ongoing finances are, are, uh, are coming in. We'll be grateful for that. So, uh, Brother Dale, are you the one praying? Come on up. And, um, I got it. yeah, you got it right there. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for Stephen and Melody and what they bring into us this morning, God. We just thank you so much that they're blessing us the way they are. And Lord, we just want to uh, lift up Hilton Terrace to you today. And uh, Brother John brings a message to them. And God, we ask that you be with Buddy as he brings the message to us. And Lord, I want to lift up our team, God. I just ask that you prepare the way for us. Lord, I uh, ask that you prepare the hearts and the minds of those that you will put in our path. God, we just thank you so much for those who have uh, done everything they can to get us there, whether it be with prayer, with uh, donations, or making the arrangements. God, we just thank you for that. And Lord, as we come to you now, we just uh, ask that you take a portion of what you so generously give us. Use it for your kingdom's work. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 statutes you have not kept them return to me and I will return to you says the Lord of armies yet you ask how can we return will a man rob God yet you are robbing me how do we rob you you ask by not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions you are suffering under a curse yet you the whole nation are still robbing me. Bring me the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land. And your vine and your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. 
truths. But when man robbed God, I did. Now, in the Old Testament, tithing was a law. And you had to do it to be a good Jew. We know we're not under that law now. But God hasn't changed. Hmm. And uh, I used to live under the thought that I can't afford it to give God, but he'll understand because he's a good God. And I heard someone say, and I don't remember when or where or who, if you can't live on 90% of what you make, that 10% isn't what's going to kill you. There's a bigger problem. And uh, I got with Barbara when we prayed and talked. You know, in the South, when you pray about it, it means you're thinking about it. <laughs> so we pray hard about it. And then we have, of course, to decide net or gross. And like Dave Ramsey says, well, if I'm going to get credit for it, I'm going to go for the big prize. And I'm going to tell you that we can't explain how it is that we continue to prosper. But I believe we are blessed. We are blessed by God Amen. for honoring His commands. And doing it as a church of giver. And now in Matthew, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tenth of the mint and dill and cumin. And yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. Amen. Thank you, Pharaoh. Let's ask the boys and girls to come on down for the children's time. Come on down, boys and girls. All the boys and girls, fifth grade and below. Yeah, you're supposed to play something here, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I have a question for you. Um, did, uh, do you like to give presents to people? Yes. You do? Yeah. From Santa Claus. <laughs> from what? Santa Claus. Oh, from Santa Claus. Oh, that's Santa, you give Santa Claus presents? No. <laughs> oh, he does. But who do you give presents to? Who do you give a gift to? Neighbors. No, neighbors, that's good. Uh, who, who, who do you give gifts to? Family. Your, your family? You, you, so you give to your family? Mm, this year I'm going to do it to someone other than my family. Okay. Um, you, you don't know who you are? Okay, so I got a question for you. If you give them to our friends. Your friends. All right, so um, how to, do, do you spend a lot of your paycheck on these gifts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't spend a lot of your paycheck? Oh, wait a minute. Do you have a paycheck? <laughs> you, you do, you do, but where do you get your money from? From my mom for, the, for allowances. Yeah, from your mom, and she gets it from the, your, your, your mom and daddy, really, is together. Yeah, go, yeah, she wants it now. <laughs> okay, so you want to give gifts, okay, you do. But at your station of life, you don't have a job to give it, to give your own money. So your parents help you, and they give you money, right? And then you can give gifts. Do you know that's the way it works with them, too? Now, they have jobs, and they work. But everything we have comes from God. And He gives it to us and blesses us. And it's out of His blessings that we're able to give you light and heat and food. But also we can give gifts to other neighbors too. So, just like 
you give what your father gives you. We can give out of what our father in heaven gives. And we can give it to him for his service and his work. Let's pray for his cause. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for these boys and girls, for their sweetness and even their generous heart. We ask, oh God, that they will come to a point where they will know you and love you and walk with you every day of their life. In the precious name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. All right. All the preschool, the next line, yeah, up to pre-K goes to kids' life. All the older ones stay here today, okay? So pre-kids, preschool kids, let's go to kids' life. Woo-hoo! Let's go.
sorrow for three days His body there would not remain Our God has robbed the different scripture to look at and so this is a topical type of series uh, uh, ne next week we'll wrap it up there'll be a couple of weeks with uh, some of our folks leading here while we're in then when I come back to give our report my next series is going to be the seven I am statements that's found in John and uh, this is going to be more a little bit more uh, very much going in there and look at the, the, the times and when uh, each time Jesus said I am and uh, taking uh, those verses apart, putting them back together, and applying it to our life, our spiritual life. And uh, so that's a little bit more of a biblical uh, focus uh, in the sense of the, the practical, although it's always practical, Scripture is always practical. So anyway, we're family principles. I apologize sort of for the spelling of that. I think it's, a, it's just a hook. But with the subject I was coming up with today, you just have to forgive me. I had to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Some of y'all giggle, and other you're shaking your head like, I can't believe I did that. Okay. <laughs> but you know, this is a thing. This is actually a thing. I Googled it, okay? <laughs> and uh, this, this word's all over the web, and there's a, I found pharmacy finances. That, that's a blog. That was spelled this way. So, uh, you know, I said, well, maybe I could go with it. And I couldn't. So, anyway, so, <laughs> this worked. <laughs> I just couldn't do it, even though I got the, the family uh, going that way. So, but today, we're, we're talking about finances, particularly where we're talking about family finances. <clears throat> and uh, so, we'll look, at it, we'll look at that as we go down. This is the morning that you may want to take notes, okay? Especially if you're here with your, uh, your, your wife or your husband. And I would encourage you if uh, you're just now setting up a household or living on your own. And, and, and even if you do not have uh, a partner or uh, a mate to work with on this, 
Everything we discuss today will work on every level of your personal finances. The immediate application is going to be to the family. But I promise you, the, the principles we talk about will work for somebody like Stephen. Oh, excuse me, am I picking on you? You're not going to remember. Okay. Like Luke. <laughs> But somebody who, who is single, that uh, has got a job, and yet they don't have anybody there, family, even if they're living with mom and dad, everything we discuss, regardless of your stage in life, will be, uh, be helpful today, okay? So um, we, you may want to take notes, especially if your wife or husband is here, because there may come up the time where uh, uh, he didn't really say that, and you, you can go back and say, yeah, I got it right here, I wrote it down. <laughs> and then there'll, be a, then there'll be a time that, I can't believe he said that out loud. <laughs> and so you take some notes. Uh, I'll be putting some things on there uh, uh, on the screen that you may want to, a little summations that you may want to, uh, want to write down, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, I did, I've done a lot of research in the past over this and I've uh, brushed up on it. And I wish I could tell you this was a great original sermon. It is in the sense that it's my message. But uh, these guys that I've pulled from are a lot smarter than I am. Uh, but, uh, but I tell you, I do believe these, the principles that we're talking about are biblical. And they work. And I've seen them work in my own life and the life of this church. So before we go to this, let's go to the Lord in the, one more time. Lord, we are so grateful to be here today. We thank you, O oh God, for the worship, for the fellowship, and the joy of being in your presence among us our family and friends. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, walk with me on this now. Speak through me. Use my lips to play. Lord, if you don't say anything this morning, nothing will be said. So this morning is yours, come the entire day, especially this moment. We give you the glory for what you want to do. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, now, there's one other caveat about this. Uh, this is uh, August. August, we have four or five birthdays in our family amongst my kids and grandkids. And so we all got together, and my Augusta crowd here, and uh, Bonnie and uh, Steve, and uh, uh, Bonnie is my uh, oldest daughter, who has produced uh, uh, wonderful grandchildren and a great grandson. And so Steve and Bonnie are special. <laughs> They're grandparents. <laughs> and then Bethany, y'all all know Bethany and Jeremy, uh, her husband, and, uh, the, and of course Benji and the girls here, were, uh, they, they, they come. But the funny thing about it, that row sitting right there, three out of those four people are CPAs. <laughs> and you already hear where I'm going. I, I'm already dreading our Sunday lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be an in interesting discussion, I am sure. But, uh, but anyway. Okay, look, we, so Pharaoh started off uh, talking about tithing and his personal testimony. I'd encourage you to ask him more about that. Uh, tithing is a thing in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. There's no question about it. There's some debate whether it's 10% or 20% or even 33%. Uh, some say it's 10% every uh, three times a year, which makes a 30% uh, uh, tithe from the Israelites to, uh, the, uh, to the Levites. But uh, that's the Old Testament. We are not required to fulfill that law. And I'm telling you, if anybody tells you that you are required as a believer to tithe 10% of your income to the church by law, I will tell you that is wrong. I do not believe that. But I do think it's clear that it is a principle that we can look at, and we have. Uh, God does bless you when you give to His work. He does. But that should not be our motive. We should not be motivated that if I give this to God, He blesses me. We give to God not out of requirement. We don't give to God so He'll bless me. We give to God because we worship with our tithes and offerings. Yeah. That's why we give. Yeah. So we give to Him so He can bless us, and He does bless us. But the reason He blesses us is so we can have more to give. Yeah. Now, another issue about this giving and tithing, uh, to say the least, is not a salvation issue. And this is important. Because some, you've heard before, but others would say this, but 
You will not be lost for all eternity if you never give. Grace is bigger than that. But the other side of that coin is tithing and giving, the more you give, that's not going to get you to heaven. You can give God all the money you want, but unless you place your faith, personal trust in Him for what He did on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you're going to split hell wide open. Yeah. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy your way out of hell by giving to the church or to God or anything else. If you understand this, you understand that giving is an act of worship. Right. And yet you're still struggling, either in your personal finances, family finances. Today's going to help you. Even if you're not tithing, even if you're not tithing, when you understand what the Scripture says about money, you will do better because, and here this, this is it, okay? Because God will not bless 10% your 10% giving if you are 90% foolish. So you can give 10% to God right off the top of your paycheck every single week. But if you play the fool on the rest of the 90%, God's going to go, you're making your own bed. He's under no obligation to fix your foolishness. So today we're, we're talking about how to spend that uh, uh, 90%. So if you look at your income, you go, okay, 10% is the model, and I'm telling you that's model. I, per, uh, I know many people, many of you give more than 10%. Some of you give all you can, and it's less than 10%. 10% is just the model. But say, let's just go with the 10%. That means 90% is, is what you do with it. Uh, so um, with that in mind, we're done with 10% of this message, and we're going to move on to the 90%. So no more about the giving, okay? <laughs> One of the most foundational passages that is not often mentioned when it comes to finances is found in Exodus. Uh, and you don't have to turn this because you know this passage very well. I will read it to you and see if you can recognize it. It comes out of the 20th chapter of Exodus. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor you shall covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, that's number 10 of the top 10 list in God's eyes, okay? That's the 10th commandment of the top 10. So uh, it says, you shall not co covet your neighbor or anything they got. All right? Look at this right here, okay? Um... The path of financial peace, the way you get to financial peace is through contentment. Because contentment is what you have to have not to covet, not to break number 10. So coveting is what I, you got something I want. Contentment is you have a lot of stuff. I'm good with what I got. And you have peace about that. And uh, so that, that, that's what, so financial peace only comes with contentment. You have to make a decision, I am content with what I have. And family finances, if you want to do something on this, be real honest, it starts with my very first point here, is partner principles. We're just going to go down through some of the basic partner principles here. Um, and uh, I'm going to remind you, Genesis 2, uh, 224, we actually read this last week. It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his wife, and his, excuse me, leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, not leaving the wife, <laughs> joined to his wife, and they shall uh, become one flesh. So when we're looking at the husband and wife relationship, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the family. Now, I'm going to ask you if you would turn to Philippians 2, the second chapter of Philippians, where we'll walk through this verse, okay? Of these couple of verses, and then we'll draw some, draw some of the principles out of it, okay? Philippians chapter 2, starting with, uh, we'll start with verse 1. You see the there, therefore there, every time you see therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. You can throw back to verse 27 of chapter 1, and that word, verse 27 of chapter 1 says, Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
so that whether I come to see, see you or remain absent, I will hear what you are standing firm in the one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's the therefore. So when he comes back here, because he's uh, been dealing with that, he comes to therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. Now, he's going to tell us how to make his joy complete. Now, if we read this and sit there and okay, go, well, you know, Paul's dead. He lost his head over his job. Did you hear about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the rumor is, and it's just a rumor, that uh, he was beheaded by the Romans uh, for preaching. Uh, so a couple of millennial goals. So, you, you know, making his joy complete is uh, not important at this point. His joy is complete in the presence of God. I can tell you that I think in principle, we can say to make our joy complete as a fellowship, even as individuals. That's the application. He's talking about his joy, particularly writing to the Philippians because he was very close to them. So let's make our joy in the application complete. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intending in one purpose. Verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with hum uh, humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Now, you see all the things that's going on here? I mean, he goes through a list of stuff that's all about being one, one with each other, one with love, one in spirit, giving in mind, in humility of mind, all this stuff. Now, you look at that. That's if I'm going to ask you a question. What would happen if we applied this principle that Paul was writing, saying, make my joy complete, to this church, what if we apply this passage to your family? He's writing to a church. I think this applies directly to the church, and there's a whole series of sermons on every one of those points right there that we could apply to the SRB right here. But looking at it sort of on a broad spectrum and applying it to our personal family life, what would happen? If what would happen if you applied this to the, our church and even the, your theological differences, your life goals, your job? What would happen if you had this mentality at your personal workplace? What about in your personal relationship with your children? What would happen? What would happen if you took the principles that's found in this about, uh, about being of same love, united in the spirit, one purpose, one mind, humility of mind, uh, uh, seeing others are more important, not merely looking at your own personal interests, but the interests of others. What if you said, let's apply this to my family finances? What would happen? <clears throat> well, I think the core issue in this would be, here it goes, the core issue would be treat your family like you would treat other believers. Okay? Think about this, okay? Look, look, look at it up here. Back one more. Treat your family <coughs> like we are to treat other believers. <coughs> If we look at this verse, this passage, oh wait a minute, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, love your neighbor as yourself, but you can treat your family like Christ. No. We're going to love God, we're going to love others. And folks, if they don't start within the home, it's not going to get out the front door. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's look at all these verses, this, these principles, in light of our own personal finances. This should be, there should be no such thing as an independent financial decision of your mate. It's a very strong, strong statement on this, okay? Ask yourself these questions in light of this passage. What can I do in our finances to be a blessing to my mate, to my family? What can you do? How can, how can my spending be a blessing to them? According to Philippians 2, 
What if family, the, if, if, what if you, with your family finances, you were to encourage, be an encouragement to your mate the way you spent your money? That you, you would show his love through the way you spent it? You were in one spirit together as a family with your, your husband and wife. This uh, that resulted in affection and compassion, and or you're on the same page in decisions, and both are headed in the same direction and the same purpose. What would happen to your finances? What would happen if you both would do nothing out of self motivations, do nothing out of empty pride, but rather out of humility and selfishness, not looking out for yourself, but in the interest of your mate and your family? What would happen to your finances if you would take? These two, three verses, and say, boom, into my life. This is where I made my decisions. What would happen? You know, this has nothing to do with the balance in your checkbook. Nothing. The bottom line here. Absolute bottom line. Husbands and wives and yea, even families must be on the same financial page. Period. And when you're looking at all the, 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 the oneness that is here, this mind and mind and love and unity right here, you have these, these are decisions you make. You come together and say, okay, you're here, I'm here. We got to get on the same page, be one mind, come together. Figure it out. Yeah. And when it comes to finances, this is hard. Because everybody's got their own idea. They've got their own priorities. They want to spend the money the way they want to spend it. And you know this. this is, you know this. If you're married or ever been married, you know that the financial discussions are always the most difficult discussions. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's been doing it longer than anybody else around here. <laughs> <laughs> Must be on the same line. So let's look at some. Let's look at some practical priorities, okay? Uh, practical priorities. Setting priorities about the man. This is just sort of a, a list here, okay? Now, practical priorities, okay? If we're going to look at practical priorities according to the culture, this is what our culture would tell you. It would tell you that your lifestyle is the most important thing to do. That your debt payments must be paid or it affects your lifestyle. You Then you invest in the place you can invest the most money to get the highest return. And then you start saving all that money that you're risking in the investments that you're making on that unless you're putting it back in there. And then we talk about what we're going to give away. Mainly because so we can get the tax credit so we don't get eat up on money that we made. Which, by the way, if the only reason you're giving to God is so you can claim it on your taxes, what do you think God thinks about that? Man, did I say that out loud? <laughs> What's the scriptural priority on this, okay? What does the scripture say? Let's just put them in there. Giving comes first. You don't give on the last 10%. You give on the first fruits. Okay, so giving comes first. Then saving. Then debt retirement. Uh, then investment. And then lifestyle is, comes after all that. Now, let's just take these apart one at a time, okay? Just one at a time, looking at giving. First Corinthians, and to write these verses down as I go through it, it's how it continues to drive for me here. Giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and reflecting back to the Malachi and Matthew passage that uh, even the Pharaoh read. But look at but all I've said, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Now I say, now I say, he who sows spiritually will also reap spiritually, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's not new news, is it? I mean, this is the law of the, the, uh, of the sword. You, know, you get what you plant. You reap what you sow. And if you're going to reap according to what the culture tells you, if you're going to sow according to what the culture tells you to do, you will reap fruit that God is not going to bless. Because they're certainly not going to look at Philippians 2 and go down here and say, this is my attitude toward my finances. 
savings and investment. I put savings and investment together on this because it's sort of going to go together, especially scripturally. Proverbs 6, 6 and uh, 3 8. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise. Which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. Now, this is the bottom line is when you have some extra money, and I think there's a problem right there. We'll deal with that. But you take your money and you prepare down the road, both with savings and investments. The problem is that most of us, when you're, getting, when you're listening to a message like this, is you're listening to it carefully and saying, okay, help me out, but here we're drowning in our, in our bills. What can I do? This, this is one of the principles that I'm going to go through, okay, that you have to get a handle on this, okay? I will tell you, every family in this room, any family, the most important thing that you should have in your finances is an emergency fund. That extra money set aside that you do not touch, it is there until something breaks its expensive or catastrophic or unexpected. Okay, <laughs> unexpected. Unforeseen. Sometimes we expect that air conditioner to go ahead and eat that. <laughs> but unforeseen. And you say, well, look, if I, if I had an emergency fund, I wouldn't be in any trouble. How do you start when you don't have one at all? You start with that first little bit. That first extra hundred dollars that you found that you instead of going to movie and dinner, you put it in the set aside. Even if it takes ten dollars a week in ten weeks, you got a hundred dollars. But the truth is, every one of us can do something more than that. You start with $100 and go to $200. And you work to the very first thing you do before you do anything else, you get a $1,000 emergency fund. Now, if you've heard that, I don't know what you think about the financial pay stuff. The Dave Ramsey that's his figure. Uh, he, he, I think he's good on most of his stuff. I, so I, I like him. But there's also other things he said that I go, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Because other people I've talked to. But that thousand dollars, I remember when we got that thousand dollars, and I literally put it in an envelope, sealed the envelope, marked on it one thousand dollar. No, actually, I think I said just E R, which that's really for emergency room, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it says E R on it. I promise you. <laughs> But, okay, so I put that, and I've got an old safe that my, uh, my granddaddy had. I don't remember my granddaddy without a safe, but it's about this tall. It's a big one. It looks really cool. So I put that cash in the safe, and it's there. Maybe since we've had it over the years, we've touched it one time. But what that happens is that when you know you got that, that gives you a little bit of and that clears your mind when you're making the tough decisions about your finances. So get that first thing. Then, then start saving. And, you know, the saving part right here, and some people say save to give first. Okay, I'm telling you, everything I'm saying about what you're doing right here starts at the 90%. Give is the very first thing. Even secular, godless financial counselors tell you, give 10% of your income. And they tell you to give it at godless, non-believing charities. So we're talking about the 90% here. Now, whether you can give 10%, I had one, one of my deacons we were going through this. This was years ago. He is not here. Most of you would not know him. Uh, but he came here, got on conviction, and he just on conviction, he said, buddy, I, I can't give 10%. We are so tight. And I didn't say, well, how much can you give? No. I said, don't worry about that 10%. Don't worry about giving. You give what you can. You give that off the top every single week. 
and give up something else like that movie or death. So um, that's what he did. And this was this was a dig. So anyway, emergency fund and then start putting some savings and investments. Okay, when I when I talk about in investments here, I'm talking about investments and branches is one of the ones that's uh, is, is, is posted by stock market. I'm posted by stock market. That's, that my retirement's been there for a long time just because it's always been there. Uh, the soft stock market right now is a great time to talk about it. Okay, it's the highest in history. You know, oh no, it's the longest bull run in history. Oh. So um, you, you have to get peace about where you want to where you won't put it, but you want to start saving your money, and you you will save you will save monies that you will need that you won't need for at least one to five years. The emergency fund is for that. Uh oh, this will happen next week, next month. But put it in a safe place for the next one to five years. That's savings, and then your investing is monies that you will not need for five years. That's where your retirement stuff goes. And I'm not a financial counselor on, on all this, but I will tell you that that's what they tell me. And if you need to know more about that, I would encourage you to talk with Farrell or some, uh, some others that you know that are professional at that. But debt repayment. I can tell you about debt repayment because, oh yeah, I have paid some debts. <laughs> Psalms, just some quotes and some uh, Psalms 37 and uh, uh, chapter 22. So 37 21 says, The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. When you don't pay your debts, nobody thinks you're righteous or gracious. The righteous and gracious, godly characteristics, part of that goes with paying your debts. Whether you're using, uh, there's a difference between using somebody else's money and, and being in debt. If you had, and this again, this is another one of those things that's funny, funny, fuzzy. Some people say that you should go anybody, anything for any reason. Others says, if you got a debt that you're into and you can liquidate it quickly and get out of it, that's not really a debt, it's just you're using somebody else's money. Uh, I will uh, 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 trust your discernment on that. I have a tendency to go with somewhere in between all that. But the bottom line is, if you owe somebody money, if you owe an organization money, if you owe a Visa card, that you have a debt, pay it. There are several stories there. And there are, just know this, if you got a debt that bothers you, is telling you. Just call the folks and talk to them. The most recent account I had with this was last year, last July, when I had surgery and you know racked up ten thousand plus hospital bills, which is not very much considering um, everything. Oh, but that's after the, the insurance. <laughs> so when we got all the bills in and we started getting the collection notices, and they, they, they tell you call in, they say, well, you got to wait to get all your bills in. And then we'll file a claim. I said, well, I'm already getting collection notices. And, you know, that, that's that routine. So anyway, when it all came done, I settled with uh, uh, the, the hospital. Uh, and uh, we got them all paid, the little, the little ones that settled the hospital with all over the 10 grand. And uh, been paying on it ever since. Um, but I talk, called them up, talked to them. I gave them a figure that, that I told them I can meet this figure. They wanted more. I said, I can meet this figure. They took it. So far as I'm concerned, the people that I went in debt to the hospital, I'm not in debt to. I am doing what they agreed to do. You can have the debt, but what God does not honor what is such a detriment to even Christian, your Christian witness is you got a debt that you're ignoring or dodging. Which, by the way, I will tell you this. Next month, I'll pay the very last bill on that hospital bed. Mm -hmm. That feels pretty good. So, when I'm going through this stuff on debt, 
just I know that it's <coughs> fresh and real with me. And there's just times you just got to suck it up and do it. And there's other times when you do that and you keep your giving in mind, God says, grace. And He blesses you financially that you wait for you to see it coming. In amounts you didn't know there were going to be there. I'm sorry. Especially avoid using somebody else's debt. Or the Avoid use of the debt because the rich rules over the poor. The borrower becomes the lender's slave. When you're in debt, who you are indebted to is your boss. Just this week, this week I pulled up. There was a record sitting right there with a car. And this big old hunting, heavy guy. Walking around, adjusting things. Look like a bad actor on a bad TV show. <laughs> but that was his truck. <laughs> and I pulled up, and, you know, so I looked at it and I said, uh, that's a strange place to pick up a car. And I said, I wrote that one, and I said, just pick yourself up one? He said, yeah, the brakes were on, I had to get it out. Just make some adjustments. I was looking at somebody's car and I just got people. I looked at a man doing his job. Nobody likes to be with him. Well, somebody's got to smile at him. But I looked at that car. Somebody is really angry. Somebody is really hurt. Somebody is devastated. Somebody don't know how to do the work. That somebody ain't got a clue how to manage your finances to biblical principles. One other thing about debt, especially avoiding somebody else's debt. Proverbs 17 18 says, A man lacking in sense pledges and becomes a guarantor in the presence of his neighbor. In other words, co signing somebody else's loan. Now let, let me just say something right about that, okay? Don't co sign somebody's loan. Now, there are exceptions to that. <laughs> Parents, maybe your child. <laughs> and that's okay. Mm -hmm. it, I think it is, okay? As long as when you sign your piece of paper on there, you are absolutely 100% totally willing to pay that complete note off for your child. Because when they go late, it's on your name. So all I'm saying is, if you want to do that, get kid. Now, somebody else needs to alone. I would tell you, don't co-sign it. If you can afford to pay it off, just give them the money. And be done with it. Alright, last thing, lifestyle. Timothy, first Timothy says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain. Did you hear that? Godliness is a means of great gain. And when accompanied by contentment, for we have bought, brought nothing into this world so we can take nothing out of it either. We have food and covering and these we shall be content with. In other words, sat, be satisfied with what you have in the basic necessities. Yeah. Contentment. 1 Timothy 6 17 says, instruct, uh, instruct, this is Paul writing to Timothy, telling him what to say to his church folks. <laughs> instruct those who are rich in the presence uh, uh, in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on their uncertain riches, but to fix their hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. <coughs> All right, one, one more common sense thing here. This comes out of an unwritten verse. Okay, the verse is, Wealth attained by fraud is in windows, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Okay, you ready for this? Ready to come to the side of here. Spend less than you earn. Hell, that is the simplest, most basic financial principle on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Proverbs 21 20. 
There is a precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man swallows it up. Couple of one things that will hurry on this, okay? Financial maturity. Financial maturity can be defined this way. Give up today's desire for the future blessings of benefits. Give up today's desire for future blessings or benefits. Another idea on this is financial maturity. You spend and give less than you earn, save what is left, and invest what you save. Look at these three things right here. Spend and give from the, the spend that's that 90% give, or give less than you earn. Then save what is left. And invest what you save. Just three simple things. Some of these are steps too. Some of you can't get to the first one yet. And that's where you need to start. Personal planning, I'm going to wrap it up with these, okay? Personal planning with your mates. There's five steps. And the one i got to say this one is very important. Communication. When you're dealing with finances, and we know uh, that finances can be uh, a disaster on marriage. Communication. This communication idea is both with God and with each other. And I would tell you, families, husbands, wives, even with your children, especially your adult children. Pray for wisdom. Seek His wisdom from, from His Word. That's the spiritual thing. Here's your practical thing. Watch this. Listen more than you talk. Now that's good advice almost across the board. But when it comes to finances, listen to your heart. Listen to your family. Every this is the best single thing that put me and Carol back on track several years ago. She, she, she takes care of the budget. She does uh, all of it. She does the uh, Quicken Pro line, whatever it is, QuickBooks. Um, if I had to know my bank balance, um, it would be a problem. And, you know, she's got it on her phone. So she takes care of all that. The best thing for our marriage over the past 10 years, the best thing that's been for our finances, is that every payday we sit down and talk about our bills. Every single payday. And I was real important when we lived week by week. She was real good about balancing the notes. When we had, you know, we had this much bills and this much money, that's when she just wouldn't know what to do. And I would listen to her and we'd sit there and I and we discern which one could be put off, which one came, which one you need to call, say next week. And she'd go, okay. But talking about it. Now the gender is not particular here. It's just the way we her. It could be that you both have uh, got your balance on the, your phone. The big thing is that on payday, when it all comes in, you sit down there and you figure out how you pay your bills. Now, to be honest with you, we're at the point where we could probably do that by the month and not do it every week. But we do it every week. Just because the communication is very, very important. The most important part about our relationship and our finances. Second thing, consider, consider honestly where you are. You've got to figure out where you are. If you, you may need to make some lifestyle adjustments, both with your vehicles or your property. Prioritize. Prioritize your needs and your goals. Make sure that your goals are out there and that you're not calling a goal a need. I need it now. Prepare a workable plan. Prepare. Figure it out. Put it on paper. Then practice what you have planned. Keep good records. All right. Walk away. Ready? Walk away. Let's see. Here we go. God knows your finances. He knows all about your finances. He knows. He's sovereign. He is all-knowing. He knows exactly where you sit right now financially. You are not hiding it from Him. He knows. Trust in His way. What I did today, and obviously taking too much time, 
uh, what I think today is just a, a, a drop in the bucket of how many people and transport transcripts. Finances is the single most talked about topic in scripture, I think, other than Christ himself. Christ taught on finances and used them as illustration more than any other topic. Once you figure this out, that this book is 2,000 years old, it is still around, it is God's word, dive into it to learn the principles. We come here to the end time of invitation. Um, Crit, uh, the singing, singing melody coming up here. The song that we sing today is going to be important. And I want, to, I want you to sing this song with them. Are you okay? Thank you, Lord.
what you have done for us this morning. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Does not meet directly after uh, today. It will meet this afternoon at 4 30. And then SRB nights, I'll tell you more about that, of course. Tomorrow, tomorrow the men, or the, mostly the men, uh, the CDA ministers uh, will meet up here at Summer Grove. And uh, so uh, tonight, I will, while I'm thinking about it, when, we, uh, when you bring your food for tonight, for, t- uh, for my night, Think about uh, maybe some sweets or something like that that we could leave left over for our preachers to know on tomorrow when we get here before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's today at 11 o'clock. Of course, Wednesday night, our prayer team study. Uh, 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 children's take time change. Please notice that today, 4.30, not at the previous last time. Uh, but tonight, we'll be uh, continuing our study of Friends and Faith. I don't know if you're reading this book. If you read the second chapter, you just sit there and go, yes, this is what we need to know, what we need to be doing. We need not to be talking so much about what we know, but train so we know what to do. And uh, that will uh, be continuing tonight for all the adults and the students are joining us for this because it's very, very much where they are. Uh, so, and uh, the SRB uh, Kids Night Life will be also as well tonight. There's a study to continue. If you, you haven't got this book, this available on, on Amazon, and uh, it's, it's worth it, folks. It is worth it. Tuesday night, our Bible studies, our in-depth Bible studies, and men and women meet up here in this building, but separately, women are going to our study in Hosea, the men are in Psalms. Uh, every man, every woman is invited to come up here to this child care, and uh, this is time of very much in-depth Bible study, very specific. And uh, choir rehearsal starts Wednesday, September the 5th. That is the 5th. That is after the first Wednesday after Labor Day. And uh, so, looks like we'll have a good crowd. It's going to start at 7.45, which, of course, means that prayer time will be out on time. Uh, bah, bah, oh, and here's what we're saying. Peace has come. Uh, a musical for Christmas. Uh, about this and then, not man, not man, Alan. And Alan, and any of you teenagers who want to sing with this, you certainly like to. All right. New announcement here, okay? This right here is the home page of our new YouTube page. Uh, this is something that's been I've been, been trying to do for a couple of years. Uh, to be honest with you, it makes me a better preacher by watching me. And uh, John, 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 oh, one of my <laughs> John is a uh, talent of, of editing on this, and I mean, if you look at it, you just gotta know it is a you know one person uh, operation, but it's not just like a uh, Facebook Live where you sit there holding the camera. Uh, so anyway, if you want to go to do this, it's, it's public now. We've had it sort of hidden for for a couple months. Go to your you go to YouTube and uh, and search for SRV Life Space Columbus. If you now search just for SRB Live, you get some kind of snob life site. You don't want to go there. But uh, but SRB Live and put Columbus on there, and it'll, this page right here will come up. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I want you to we're not I want you to uh, look at it. I want you to subscribe subscribe for it. The more subscribers we get, it's important. But I want your feedback on the service. To be honest with you, even my preaching, if anybody says it went too long today, I'll go, I know. <laughs> but uh, and you can send them to me or John and talk to us uh, individually about it. And of course, you can always go to our Facebook pages and we keep up with us that way. All right, Miss Vicki. Heart to Heart, Thursday night, our monthly meeting. Thank you for, I'm so sorry it's not on, on the PowerPoint. Heart to Heart will be this Thursday night, they start at? You do not have to have a reservation to come. Just come as you are. You know who's talking? It's a surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> and the ladies at Heart to Heart, are, this is our ladies ministry, and then Mickey and Rhonda uh, uh, are over, and it's always precious. 
In the guest, I didn't bring it up. Okay, if you have a chorus to sing and walk away from, all right. Let's stand, grab a hand, and sing this last chorus. 